I want to come back to Thich Nhat Hanh now for a moment. You see, when we talk about emptiness, we're not talking about just the non-existence of something. We're simply saying that the way you thought you existed isn't quite reflective of reality. You do exist, of course you exist. You're sitting in front of me right now, but not in the way we might have thought. We're challenging that habitual way of looking at the self. And so Thich Nhat Hanh, in Exploring Emptiness, tells a story about a cloud. So we're gonna look at that story. I have adapted it just a little bit, but I think it's a fun adaptation, and it will illustrate the Buddhist notion of emptiness, and all of these things very nicely. So here's the story of the cloud. It's about the cloud's birthday. Kind of cute, huh? Sometimes people ask you, cloud, when is your birthday? But you might ask yourself a more interesting question. Before that day, which is called my birthday, where was I? You can ask yourself that question or ask the cloud. What is your date of birth? Before you were born, Cloud, where were you? If you ask the Cloud, how old are you? Can you give me your date of birth? You can listen deeply, and you may hear a reply. You can imagine the Cloud being born. Before being born, it was the water on the ocean surface. Or it was the river, and it became the vapor. It was also the sun, because the sun makes the vapor. The wind is there, too, helping the water to evaporate and become the cloud. The cloud doesn't come from nothing. There has been, stay with me, there has been only a change in form. The cloud doesn't come from nothing. There's only been a change in form. It's not a birth of something out of nothing. Sooner or later, the cloud will change back into rain or snow or ice. If you look deeply into the rain, you can see the cloud. The cloud is not lost. It is transformed. Highlight, transformed. It's one of our words there, transformation. Oh, it should be. I'll write it there. I'll write it there, transformation. It's transformed into rain, and the rain is transformed into healthy soil, and the soil is transformed into pumpkin plants. And the pumpkin plants are transformed into blossoms, and with the help of our friends, the bees, the blossoms are transformed into pumpkins and then into the pumpkin pie you eat. So today, if you eat a piece of pumpkin pie, give yourself time to look at the pie and say, Hey, Cloud, I see you. By doing that, you have insight and understanding into the real nature of the pie and the real nature of the cloud. You can also see the ocean, the river, the heat, the sun, the soil, the trees in the pie. Looking deeply, looking deeply, you do not see a real date of death for the cloud nor a date of birth for the pumpkins. Nothing has been created. I'm emphasizing that. Nothing has been created. It was already there. All that happens is that the cloud transforms into rain or snow. There's always a continuation. That, that needs to go there, too. There's always a continuation. A cloud continues the ocean, the river, and the heat of the sun. And the rain continues the cloud. So what are the two words I need to write? Transformation and continuation. You were listening. <laughs> Transformation and continuation. So these are just kind of dependent origination. So you, we all know what we're doing. is the philosophical way of talking about emptiness. And these are key words that came to life in the telling of that charming little story. But don't think, you know, get, into, get out of that academic Mindset, oh, I've got to define, make a flashcard. Blah, blah, blah. It's all emptiness. There are different ways of looking and exploring this idea of emptiness. Because 
by looking at interconnectedness. We see how the cloud and the rain and the sun and everything is all connected, right? But we also see how one causes the other, how the evaporation of the water, the rivers, the lakes, caused it to manifest, to transform, caused it to turn into water vapor. And the water vapor reaches the point of condensation and it falls as rain. Precipitation, right? And so there's this continuation. There's this cycle of cause and effect at work. There are different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. Do you see? Manifestation. Why? I'm going to ask you. Why did Thich Nhat Hanh prefer this word, manifestation, to the word creation? Why didn't he talk about the cloud being born or the cloud being created? Why did he prefer instead to talk about the cloud's manifestation? He talks about this story and other stories, and he always uses the word manifestation. If it wasn't explicit, let's make it so. He talks about the cloud's manifestation. He talks about its transformation. Why does he like this language? Transformation rather than creation. Free. Because it was always already there. It was never created. Because it was all it was already there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it was never created or destroyed. It was all always right. there. It wasn't created or destroyed in the traditional sense. We think very simply, he explains elsewhere, about this notion of creation, as if, poof, something could come from nothing. But by looking deeply, we're breaking through those dualistic notions of life and death. Something doesn't come from nothing. Something is totally dependent on unnameable causes, an infinite number of causes, myriad causes. The evaporation, the winds, Everything going on in the atmosphere, allowing the cloud to manifest. But even then, have you ever been lying on the beach one afternoon and you see clouds going by and they make little shapes and it looks like a giraffe or it looks like, you know, you can find little shapes and then it, next time you look, you see it all distorted and then whoosh, it's gone, right? Even then, there's this movement at play. The cloud just continues the river in that sense. So you see all of these words are just kind of key words that take us deeper into the teaching that describe this business of looking deeply. Notice that we're employing cyclical thought rather than linear thought by this new way of thinking about appearance, manifestation, transformation. Rather than thinking in a linear way, which is a typically Western thing to do, you know, to try to find some uh, ultimate first beginning and, and then to look at the <coughs> timeline from there, we're looking at reality as a cycle, that everything goes through these changes. And as long as all of these causes, including time, come together, you have the manifestation of something like the pumpkin, right? You have the blossom. You have the male blossom first, actually, and the bees come and, and uh, take the pollen and deposit it into the female blossom, and a pumpkin is born. But it's not like, psh, it's just born out of nothing. It's this result that comes from all of these other things that have also taken place. And if one cause, one ingredient is missing, you don't have the pumpkins. And you look out to the trees, or you look out to the field, you look out to the vines, and you say, hmm. There are no pumpkins this year. That's funny. Something was missing. It was too cold this year, perhaps. One of those ingredients wasn't there. But Thich Nhat Hanh would say, look closely. They are there. We just need more time. It's said if you can look at a box of matches and see the flame, you're already enlightened. It's there. It's just that that one ingredient, time, isn't there yet. But by looking deeply, you can penetrate into reality and see things in a deeper way, like, like the blue sky, like ourselves, and understand that our identity isn't necessarily tied in to something that's fixed. Habitually, we think of ourselves as having a fixed identity. 
But now, let's go back to what you wrote on your paper. What was so important to you as a kid? Anybody want to share? What'd you put? Ice cream. Ice cream? What did you put? <laughs> Playing handball. Playing handball? Jamie? Stuffed animals. Stuffed animals? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. Do, do you still like handball, Troy? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that doesn't work for me. Say no. <laughs> I'm going to have you guys do a fun little chart next week. The uh, famous little favorites chart. And um, it asks you to, to explore these things. And we have a lot of fun with it because sometimes people look back to their childhoods and they say what they love to do. And, and I don't know why one year everyone put Power Rangers to describe what they liked best when they were five. It was the funniest thing. It must have been, you know, the generation or something that particular year, and everybody, when they looked back 15 years, they got to the year when Power Rangers were really big or something like that. But <laughs> it was the funniest thing. <laughs> Do you still like ice cream? I, I eat ice cream every day. It's funny because when I was a kid, I was like, when I'm going to buy it, and now you can, and there are no adults telling exactly. you not to, right? Who put Power Rangers? Come on, work with me here. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I liked Flintstones. I still do like the Flintstones also. But even then, I can propose to you that it's a different person who likes the Flintstones. And it's a different guy who plays handball, if you still like him. And it's a different girl who likes ice cream. And chances are, a lot of you put embarrassing stuff, and that's why you're not raising your hands. And probably, <laughs> chances are, the things that we liked at some point in our lives um, might not be important to us anymore. You know, our interests change. How many of you wanted to be a fireman when you were growing up, or wanted to be something when you were growing up, and now it's completely changed? Um, yeah, was it a fireman? What was it? <laughs> What was it? He says it was weird. Well, when I was really little, I wanted to be a bus driver. A bus yeah. driver. That's not weird. I can see that. You don't want to be a bus driver anymore. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a fun way of kind of exploring our identity. And it's, it's a fun way of looking at the fact <coughs> that identity doesn't need to be equated with something that's fixed. And that's called seeing into what Buddhists would call suchness. This suchness that is reality. This suchness that really can't be named at all. Because we're constantly changing. We change our tastes. We change our moods. We change our goals. We see more realistically now, oh, I don't want to drive a bus. <laughs> but yet, we give a name to these things which really can't be named. Why do we do that? For convenience sake. You know, even ourselves, okay, so we don't have a fixed identity. Okay, the rug's been pulled out from under us. Yet I still give myself a name. Donna, Troy, Mark, Melissa. I don't think I actually have a Melissa in this class, but. <laughs> Why do we do that? Well, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It saves us from grunting at each other. Hey, oh, you know. We say, hey, Donna, yeah, I need a piece of paper, great, you know. And we name stuff, and it makes life a whole lot easier. I used to like meteorology a lot. In fact, I used to want to be a meteorologist, not a bus driver, until I found out that there's tons of calculus that you have to take to become a meteorologist. <laughs> I, I love to watch storms. I think it's really exciting. And I remember as kids, we would run to the window and say, oh, look at the lightning. Of course, it was a big deal to us in LA, because we don't get it all the time. So it was a very special event. But wouldn't that be funny if instead we went to the window and said, oh, look, let's go see that moment where electricity is discharged within the cloud. And you have thunder, and oh, isn't it fascinating? And everybody would look at you and go, huh? <laughs> that would be weird. So to make life a lot simpler, this is the real point. We give things a name, but don't be fooled. Because once you're fooled, enter into the game of delusion. Enter into what Hindus would call maya. 
enter what Buddhists would call ignorance. 